How are we doing, guys? Everyone feeling okay? Not too hot? Um, first, I want to thank Bankwest, Amazon, and Mechanical Rock guys for setting this up. This is a really cool event. Um, yeah, today I'm going to sort of talk through latency versus throughput, um, something that confused me a little bit uh, before. Who am I? Um, my main background that people are aware of me from is I wrote a book about Rx, reactive programming. Um, I'm a developer at Cashies. We are hiring, but so are VGW, so are Mechanical Rock, so are Bankwest, so is AWS. If they're here, they're cool. Go talk to them, get a job, right? If they're not here, maybe they're not cool. Um, I do the conference thing a little bit. Also do training and said technology. Um, but just because I'm a loudmouth, does that mean you should listen to me? Or well, someone at uh, latency comp thinks you should. Should you trust me? No, but I think you should. Um, we're in an applied science. Anything I say should be able to be backed up by evidence, and if it can't, go and prove me wrong. That's cool, okay? So, I was working on a project that wasn't performance sensitive. I got reminded of this time and time again. Lee, we're not in London finance anymore. This isn't performance sensitive. Don't worry about it, what we're doing is cool. We're on the cloud, we will be able to scale. But we hit our limits. We've already had a couple of comments today. Um, Tim was talking about buffering things up before you sent it into a uh, system because of contention. Rima was talking about, and we put it on a big box, 64 gigs, but it was a number, it wasn't infinity, right? You can't just scale the cloud infinitely. Um, Graham Foster and I were chatting earlier in a private conversation about, yeah, we could do this, but won't we run out of IP addresses? The cloud scales brilliantly, but there is a limit somewhere. In our design, we had hit some of our limits. The nice thing about the cloud, however, obviously, is it's elastic. You can scale it up and scale it down within limits, and you only pay for what you use. It's also... Um, really good that it, it, it's worldwide, it's not just sitting on your rack back at, back at the office. Our unit of concurrency was effectively a microservice. When we tried to add more, we didn't see any benefits. If we wanted to scale out, we were hitting what we call a, a single component constraint. We were hitting Armdahl's law. Anyone know Armdahl's law? We've got a couple of hands from architecty looking people. If I've got a system and 95% of that can be parallelized, i.e. 5% can't be, that's my sequential component constraint, 5% is 1 over 20, that means that most I can get a 20 times speed up of my system. Does that make sense? If 1 20th of my system must be sequential, I can only go 20 times faster if I parallelize. That's Armdale's law. He was optimistic. Gunther pointed out, actually, there's a coordination cost, and it's never zero. It's always non-zero. It might be very small, but if you have someone who has to organize things, like a team lead, a guy that organizes a conference, sometimes it's just easier and faster to do it yourself, because managing things has a cost, right? And we were hitting that cost. So, what do we do? We, we, we were hitting our throughput, uh, we were seeing limits where our throughput was being affected, and that was affecting response times. So what can we do? Well, we can move our less important stuff to be done overnight batch processing. That's a fairly common tactic. Um, or we could find a new unit of parallelization. So we could look at um, maybe uh, an actor framework. We could parallelize at the aggregate route. We could shard the data. We were having this discussion, and we are bouncing some ideas around, and then someone just called halt, said stop. Have you actually measured anything? Are we applying any engineering practices, or are we all just sitting around in a group saying catchphrases, actor model, concurrency, you know, what have we measured here? Well, we had measured some stuff. One of the things we would measured was um, the time to process a message was about 10 milliseconds, okay? So, at that point in time, we discovered something that I thought was pretty funny and pretty laughable. So, what you'll see next will shock and amaze you. Click here. So, 
question time. It's in the afternoon, we're a little bit drowsy, so I just want to sort of warm the crowd up a bit. Who here thinks that if I had a hundred million messages to process, that one month is about a good time to process all those messages? Hands up. Does everyone's arms work? Graham thinks it's a good idea. Don't work at bank. That's a terrible idea. What about one week? A weekend? A hundred million messages we're talking about. A weekend? Can we get a couple of shy hands up? A day. Some more hands are going up. Surely all the people that had their hands up previously are still agreeing. Anyone got a, a better opinion on that? What, what, how fast should 100 million messages be processed? Anyone that hasn't put their hand up got a better idea than one day? Okay. Um, what about 10 milliseconds? Is that a good time to process a message? Yeah, some nods. Uh, 100 milliseconds. One millisecond? Lots of people's hands don't work, right? We've got a couple of people going, yeah, 10 milliseconds seems to be, I've got more thumbs up, very shy thumbs up. Um, so that was interesting, but that was part of the conversation. The next part of the conversation was, okay, 100 million events times, what was that, no, 10 milliseconds I think we agreed was okay. What's 100 million times 10 milliseconds? Shout it out. Who can do math? <laughs> Not me, right? Jumped in, had to code this up to find out what it was. In fact, a bunch of us back at the office had to code it up to find out well, what is 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds, good. Less than one day, good. 100 million messages. It's 11 days. Shit. We're not very good at math. Humans are not so good with very big numbers, and we're not very good with very little numbers. And we're even worse when you put them together. If we've got a 100 million message problem, and we're working at 100 milliseconds, I don't think my PM is going to wait for me to finish that processing. They're not even going to be happy with that. One day, maybe, but if there's a bug, oh, I have to wait another day to do something with that, right? So. We then sort of flipped it around and said, well, how long, what is good? What, two hours? Two hours sounds better. It's something I can work with. It's a lunch break at least, right? I can, I can deal with this kind of flow. Damn. Those numbers look hard. Six microseconds to do something? How are we supposed to hit six microseconds? Does that sound very fast? We're at a cloud conference. Speed's free, right? We've got AWS people nodding, going, yeah, that's pretty fast. Um, so, then the conversation sort of looped back around to a bit more dogma and religion. You know what? We need to build a low latency system. No, no, no. I think you mean we want to build a high throughput system. Are they the, are they the same thing or are they different things? So I was confused, so I had to stop and understand what the definitions were. I find in our industry, we're really bad at language, probably because we're all STEM students, we're all good with numbers. All the language people are probably lawyers or, or journalists. So I think our grasp of language probably is not as strong as it could be. Who here finds that every five years the word service or container means something totally different? It's just confusing, right? Um, who has ever heard someone's uh, verb the noun? Hey, can you uh, Jira that bug for me? Well, Jira, do you mean create a ticket in Jira for that bug? Oh, right, okay. Can you UX the website? What the fuck are you talking about? Right? Um, this won't be a Tim thing, but I have heard this week, or maybe it was last week, um, we should do the BDDs. We should BDD that. Do you mean we should write, oh sorry, we should write the BDDs. Do you mean we should write the acceptance tests and follow BDD practices? It's, we're bad with language. And I think we have the same thing at latency. Oops, name of the conf. But what's, what does it mean? Most of the time when I hear someone say latency, they mean something else. Occasionally, when I hear someone talk about a low latency system, 
they are talking about latency because they've solved some other problem. And we'll look at that now. The root of the word latency is latent. Something that hasn't, is, uh, is there that hasn't yet manifest. It's dormant, right? It's not doing anything right now. So I don't think anyone's actually that interested in latency initially. It's something else they're probably in interested in. Generally, I find what they want to be talking about is response time or service time. And latency is the other thing. Okay, so latency is important, but generally that's not what we care about. We actually care about the response time. Let's visualize it. So, if we're talking about re request response, I've got a client who sends something to a processor, there's always a queue in between, right? There's always is. We then process that and spit it back. That first blue arrow, that's our response time. That's what the client sees. Does that make sense? However, if I stick a little bit of instrumentation around my method that does the thing, I'm gonna say, no, 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 it didn't take that long, it took that long, because I'm measuring at the wrong place. The delta is the latency. Is that message, that HTTP request, doing something else? It's not your processing, and it's not sitting at the client. So for straight through processing, I'm taking an event from an S3 bucket and processing it in a Lambda and shoving it into DynamoDB. That's the time that it takes to get from the S3 bucket into DynamoDB. That's the Lambda time, and everything else is latency. Yeah, sound reasonable? So then the other thing that was sort of confusing was uh, someone had mentioned batch processing as well. It looked like we had room for improvement, but it also became obvious that we previously didn't have a good grasp on language and numbers. So what else were we struggling with? Well, I was struggling with definitions of what batch processing was. So historically, the definition of batch processing in contrast to interactive processing, is that we take a, a group of files, a collection of requests or transactions or messages, batch them all up into a file and process that file. It means we can defer processing. It also means we can run it at a lower priority, so perhaps users doing something here get a high priority, batch processing gets done at a lower priority, and it reduces the processing over here, okay? Interactive processing is normally I process the request, the message, the transaction as it arrives, uh, transactional consistency, processed as soon as possible, and each message is processed independently, which potentially carries an overhead compared to batch. It's, it's the same thing said a different way. So our trade-offs are the interactive aims to process things quickly and give a fast feedback. So user clicks something, but I get a response but it may incur a higher overhead per message. Batch aims for a lower overhead, however, you've increased your latency because we're gonna run it at the end of day. But I think these trade-offs are misrepresented. It seems that batch processing, in that historical definition, is actually deferred or scheduled processing. What part of batch processing says that it can't happen right now? Why does it have to happen at the end of the day? Or hourly? And then I hear people saying, oh, maybe if you do it more than hourly, it's micro-batching. What the fuck's that got to do with it? Um, what's nice is that batch processing does look to do things at less busy periods, so you can uh, leverage uh, idle resource, reduces or amortizes overhead use, that's nice. Interactive processing, high priority, done as soon as possible. But if interactive processing is high priority and we want to do it as soon as possible, why are we leaving on the floor the performance gains from batch processing? Just because it was scheduled, it seemed that we could be using that perf gain. So on further measuring, it became clear that we had not broken that 10 millisecond measurement that we had into its constituent parts. So Rob just showed um, App Insights, that's where we're getting our measurements from. Uh, you can drill in deeper. So, what were the processing overheads? The cost of reading, querying, ingesting something is not zero. Do we agree with that? If I have to make an HTTP call to get something, or read something off a queue, or even have S3 fire a 
uh, an event and then put it into me, that's not zero. There's some cost involved. And then generally, I have to parse or translate it. So I get an HTTP request. So I've got to parse that into my Java um, model or something like that. Uh, and then I get to process it. And then I do the same thing on the way out. I'll probably serialize that to some sort of format and then put it into DynamoDB or something like that, right? But there's a cost on each of those things. And that's when we took some measurements about reading just from the disk to realize what the costs of doing these things were. So if I look up here, we've got these single message files, one kilobyte about, to read a single message. That's a thousand seconds. No, that this is a logarithmic scale here. However, if I batch those messages just into 10k files, I get a 10 times performance improvement. That was actually a big shock to me. I was like, well, reading a file is reading a file, whatever. However, if I went 10 times larger again, I got a 30 times performance improvement. This was a big shock to me. I was like, reading from the disk, that's a solved problem, isn't it? Apparently not for me. 300 times performance difference reading from the disk, writing from the disk. There's two um, graphs up there. Uh, they're both showing the same numbers, basically. But then you think about it. If this was SQL Server, Oracle, sorry, Oracle, um, and I said I want to read 100 customers out of the database, would I read 100 in one go, like top 100? Or would I say top one, top one, top one? Top? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get the whole batch at a time. If I was going to insert into the database, would I do one row at a time? No, I'm going to bulk insert those things, right? Same things for the disk. There's a cost. And what's interesting is that it was nonlinear. Reading one message actually was more expensive than reading 10 messages when amortized across the messages. So this is what the breakdown of our processing actually looked like. So we had the read, parse, process, uh, serialize, and write. Now there's two things that we need to take note here. First. You can't, oh, you can't see because the colors are washed out, but process, 0% on that chart. Because the read times were in the hundreds of milliseconds, the write times were in the hundreds of milliseconds, the processing was in, the, in microseconds. It was 7 microseconds to do the business logic, there was hundreds of milliseconds to read, which seems reasonable, right? To get something, to an HTTP request, to write to a database, Okay, and all up it was, oh sorry, these are in microseconds, so all up it added up to like 7 or 10 milliseconds. But the processing just didn't have an effect. The second thing to note is this is a pie chart, and no self-respecting data scientists use pie charts. But that's one measurement from one implementation at one end of the system. There might be a sweet spot for batch sizes, right? Uh, I noticed that in reading from the disk, which was a uh, computer at work, um, that 10, 100 kilobytes seemed to be the sweet spot. Going bigger than 100 kilobytes actually didn't gain us anything, right? You might find that there's a different sweet spot because you're not using my disk at my office, or you're not using the disk, you're using SQL or Oracle or DynamoDB. You might find that your ingest, your garbage collector really likes big batches because it runs the garbage collector less often. Or you might find that it likes really small batches so it doesn't hit the Gen 2 garbage collection as often. You need to measure that, right? And the other time that was spent was time in queues. Queues. Queues are everywhere, especially at bread top at lunch time. If you want bread top, you have to go before 12. Data coming in to your system hits a network card. Network cards just queues. Then it goes to your CPU, to your thread pool, to caches, more queues, RAM, just a place where nothing happens, right? Then you finally write to the disk, but you don't write to the disk, you write to the queue on the controller that then goes to the disk. And then we put queues in everywhere, right? And that's fine. And why do we queue? to decouple our production and consumption rates, okay? To decouple our availability. 
right? Just because that CPU is busy doing something else right now doesn't mean I should fail. Put it into a queue, the CPU will pick it up later. So then we came right back around to concurrency. If things are stuck in our queue, why not scale out? Are you serious? I just told you what. Um, we tried to scale up, but we'd hit our level of concurrency, right? At some point, you're going to hit this. We hit ours probably a wee bit too early. There were optimizations to be made. But basically, we couldn't. We started with a fairly toxic culture of, hey, performance isn't a problem here. And we kept buying that for way too long until it was too, too much pain to work backwards from. So we didn't design our system to scale out. And to be fair, the system was built years before serverless had its first commit, so that wasn't a thing. And if you want to hire devs, you want to hire devs that know the tools. And at the time, uh, we we're, were in Azure shop, and so that would be SQL Server, right? DynamoDB wasn't a skill set we had, something that could scale out like that. But even if we did want to cloud scale, you still have to know your costs. And it was mentioned earlier today, there's a cost for system warm-up like a car at winter in Russia, you have to warm up your engine, right? And there's a cost to that. So even if you spin out and spin out 100 atoms, 1,000 lambdas, there is a cost to starting up. OK, so now you've gone concurrent. How's your contention rates? You still have to get data from somewhere and put it somewhere, and you're probably going to heavily contend now. You know, be careful what you wish for. Do you want concurrency? Because it comes with a bag of problems as well, right? And you're still going to hit Umbel's Law somewhere along here. So, single-threaded performance. We realized it was really, really important. Little's Law, queuing theory, basically if you boil it down, he's saying your queue depth is your arrival rate times your processing time. Kind of makes sense, right? Once you see it, you're like, well, yeah, obviously, but it was actually quite hard to get to that solution. What that's saying is that our processing time, our single component constraint, is probably going to define our queue depth, queues. If we have bursts of traffic, our queues get big. Big queues sound like latency. If I'm sitting in a queue, I'm not being processed. Deep queues, bad. Deep queues, lots of latency. So, what does it look like? I put in message one, and while it's still processing, the queue fills up. Does that kind of make sense? Let's look at it with numbers. If I take a nominal system and say, I can process something in 100 milliseconds, when one message arrives in 100 milliseconds, the queue is empty. Fine, that's great. I get a response time of 100 milliseconds and no latency. That's good. That same system, if it gets a burst of 20 messages, is going to have a response time, an average response time, of over one second. And that's because the average latency time is 950 milliseconds. That 20th message is going to be sitting there for 19 times 100 milliseconds, 1.9 seconds before it gets serviced. That doesn't sound good. So, if the queue is filling up, we're adding latency. Three message queue. Why pay the cost of processing that message, nibbling away at that cherry each time? So I get message one. I start processing message one. Once I've finished with message one, why not just jam all the rest into the processor? It's highly likely that reading those messages is the most expensive thing to do, not processing them, right? So let's grab a batch of them and process them all at once. If we look at the, uh, that, that same table, with one message, no gain. We still get approximately zero latency and a response time of 100 milliseconds. Where we see a big difference is where we get that 20 message burst. 20 messages come in. On the good scenario, I process them all in one batch. That's great. If I can process them all in one batch, that's a response time of 100 milliseconds for everything. Worst case, I pick up, say, message one, process that, and then pick up the rest. So I have to take two goes to, fill it, uh, to process the whole lot. 
Worst case scenario, 200 milliseconds latency. Average case now is 195 milliseconds. That's a five times improvement in latency, in, in throughput. So I sort of took a leap there and said, how can one message being processed, how can the time be the same as 20 messages? Well, it won't be, but it's going to be really close. In our experience, the processing of that message is just insignificant compared to all the other crap. Right? Your I.O., if you think about what a CPU can do, a modern day CPU, even a not very modern day CPU, what it can do in one second, compared to say what your network card can do, they're, they're worlds apart, right? Read, load, write. You spend all your time doing that. And interestingly, those things like working with big sets of data. They like reading and writing one meg chunks. We don't normally have one meg message files though. So we amortize the, cross, uh, the costs of the processing logic can be negligible now, right? So what were our results? Instead of over one month for our 10 millisecond processing time, we started thinking of messages per second. So instead of thinking that time, because that just proved to be a little bit too hard. Once you start talking about 10 milliseconds, to me it actually sounds about the same as seven nanoseconds. I forget what the last bit was and just hear the number, right? If you say 100 messages a second, does that sound like that's fast enough now? We asked the question earlier, 10 milliseconds to process an event, was that okay? If I ask the same question but phrase it differently, who here thinks that 100 messages a second is a very good system? Who thinks it's a fairly poor system? Kind of interesting, right? It's almost the same question. We flipped around to batching 10,000 messages a second. That starts sounding like a sensible thing to do now, right? And also doesn't sound beyond the rounds of possibility. It's something we can do. So, latency, throughput, they need not be traded off. Improvement to one can actually improve the other. Seems obvious now though, doesn't it? Once we've done the big dance and gone right around the circle. So what part of your straight line can you improve? I found it really interesting that cloud was going to be our answer, scale out, but because we didn't build it sympathetically, we, weren't, we were cloud native, but not really. It was actually straight line performance. Just going back to basics, that was the thing that actually brought us back to being able to process the stuff in time. So, today I learned Umbel's law and Gupta's law, our max concurrency. How much concurrency can I throw at this? What's Little's law? That's my Q depth. Cost to read and write. Reading and writing one thing versus reading and writing many things. Let's lean towards trying to do as many things at, at a time as we can. Amortize that cost. Measure. You don't know what you're doing if you don't have the numbers. Applied science. We're computer scientists, we're engineers. We should have the numbers to support our ideas. And smart batching. All right, that's all I've got for today. Any questions?